Welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Nussbaum. We are continuing today with renowned expert on Islam, Dr. Bill Warner. We've been talking about his extensive research over a number of years into what Dr. Bill calls political Islam. I strongly urge you to go to his websites and check it out and order at least one of his books so you'll understand the source material for what we're talking about today. Welcome back, Dr. Bill Warner. Glad to be back. Can you tell us again, before we start with specific questions, uh, the website that people can go to to order your materials, please? Politicalislam.com. And by the way, most people, if they want to learn about Islam, they say, I'll start with the Quran. No, don't start with the Quran. Start with the life of Muhammad, the Sirah, and here's why. The Quran, when you read it, has been basically randomized. And so as a result, it's like you're all the time going, why? You're confused. You're lost. But when you read Muhammad's life, and it was a fabulous life, it should be made into a movie. It's a story. And Barry, anyone can understand a story. And what's more important, can remember a story. Because when you read abstract facts as it is when you read the Quran, it's like it's all jumbled up and it's like a pile of data. But the life of Muhammad is a beautiful story. And when I say a beautiful story, I don't mean the result and the way it ended, but it is a classic story. Muhammad starts off as a failure and winds up as an overwhelming success. So read his life, the life of Muhammad, the Sirah. Then you'll be ready to you read the Quran. Excellent advice, political Islam. It's on the web. I urge you to go. Let's pick up talking about the requirements in Islam about clothing. What are the specific things that differentiate the men from the women as far as their outward attire? Well, I'm assuming here that they've moved to America and are wearing civilian, what we'd call just ordinary clothes. So when you see a Muslim, the only way you might spot a Muslim if he's standing there is if he wears a beard and there's no mustache. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean he's a Muslim, but it is what we call a halal beard. That is, there's one of the rules of the Muslim male is supposed to, amongst other things, shave his armpits, his pubic area, and the uh, mustache. So you, but that's a subtle thing. And most Muslim men that I know, as I have many Muslim students, they just, they look ordinary. They're just people. It's the woman who looks different. And that's with the hijab, the head covering, and or the rest of it. Of course, the most astounding one is the black, uh, garb with the black niqab and that that's startling when you see it I've never grown used to looking at it because it's like as I've said earlier it's like a wall between me and the woman it must be incredibly uncomfortable especially in the heat I have t talked with women who've worn it and they just say it's almost and the worst thing is over your mouth it's like you're you're trying to suck in cool air and it doesn't work very well oh my gosh I mean, who would volunteer to wear one of those really so is, and is some of them, by the way, and some of them, by the way, are made of polyester. No breathing. No breathing. Got it. So halal, which is uh, the lifestyle uh, requirements, including diet. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit. What's different from, say, Orthodox Jews with kosher requirements? Ah, first off, let's state this. It turns out that Orthodox Jews food can be eaten by Muslims and it satisfies the halal requirement. But in general, halal, and we're only gonna talk here about halal meat. Halal meat is, fa is done with an animal facing Mecca, and then the, there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is prophet, and shh, their throat is cut. Now, the problem with this is, is they're left to bleed to death and they're still alive. And if you're doing this on a major scale, this means that the other animals can smell the blood and there's panic and adrenaline in the blood. So this is not good. But basically, it's in the process of killing. And then after that, oh, did I mention that only a Muslim can do this? So as, a, as the meat system becomes more and more Islamicized, becomes more and more halal, this means more and more ordinary butchers can't do the work. Wow. How about finances? Uh, Sharia finance is something interesting. I understand uh, <laughs> there can be no interest on loans. Um, traditional banks and finance in the United States is bypassed if you are following the rules. Can you explain that? Sharia finance is based on the idea that you don't pay, you don't pay any interest on the principal. Now, 
you may not pay any interest, but you wind up paying other fees, which oddly enough turn out to be more than the interest rate would have been paid if you had an ordinary mor mortgage. So there's a lot about Sharia finance I do not understand, but I do understand this about it, is that Sharia finance includes the paying the zakat. The zakat is a charity tax, and the charity tax includes paying for jihad. So Sharia finance helps to support jihad. Now, there are many forms of jihad here, not just the cutting off your head or running airplanes into a building. Let's talk about that, because that's the word that we in America hear the most. And it is interpreted, depending who you talk to, a dozen different ways. So let's start. What is jihad? Well, there's only one jihad in the sense of the word means effort. So it's, and that's all it means, effort. Or, and so the, you could have jihad to mean, you, you could have jihad against doing, staying up late and doing a book report. That would be a form of effort. Now, what Muslims, of course, know is that most of the jihad is associated with, and so therefore they say, oh, that's not the real jihad. The real jihad is the greater jihad, which is the inner struggle that all religions have, that is to become a better person. Well, remember me, I'm the science guy, I do the counting. So I took all the hadith, these are traditions of Muhammad, from Bukhari, which is the best known collector of these, and there's 7,000 of them. 21% of these 7,000 hadith relate to jihad. And of these, if we take out less than 2% refer to jihad as a spiritual struggle. Instead, 98% of them were cutting off heads and killing kafirs. And kafirs are not Muslims. So, so what is this story? There's a, uh, a lady in the House of Representatives here in the United States who talks about the struggle and jihad is not killing others, it's to be a better person. Is yes, she just told you that, that that is the so-called greater jihad. She's trying to divert your attention from the real jihad. Well, not real, the other jihad, which is violence against the Kafir. So she's talking about the 2% yes. and ignoring the 98%. Well, sometimes we have to do a little fudging, you know, to make it look good. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Um, You've spoken about the fact that the sword, or the use of the sword, or I guess in modern parlance, uh, any violence against non-believers is the least dangerous of jihad. What do you Precisely. mean? Precisely. Well, now, by the way, if you're getting attacked by a knife, a Muslim wielding a knife in London, all of a sudden that kind of jihad is the overwhelming importance. There are fewer people killed by jihad in the United States than do probably texting while driving, all right? So that's what I mean when I say it's not that bad. Now, if you're the, you or your family's involved in this, that's terrible. But from a statistical standpoint, it's not that significant. Whereas producing a textbook which tells the lies of Islam is the, is the jihad of speech and pen. So if you go to school here in the seventh grade in Tennessee, you'll be told in the seventh grade in a book that Islam was the highest culture that has ever lived, that the highest point of human history was in the golden age in Baghdad and, and uh, Spain. You'll be told in this textbook that women gives, the first to give women their rights was Islam. The first democracy, the first constitution was Islam. And so it goes on and on and on. And by the way, it's subtly, and oh, Islam provides protection to the Jew and the Christian. So this is what you'll learn in the textbooks. This destruction of, this is now planning basically pro propaganda lies into the children's lives. And so I maintain that that is more dangerous to us as a society than someone getting stabbed in the back or, or killed in a car crash. Well, obviously, if you can see the army coming and they have whatever weapons, then the natural inclination of all humans is to defend themselves against the seeable known enemy. What you're talking about is attack from within with an idea. Yes, and this is far more dangerous. Because, and if it were just this one textbook, but it goes on and on and on. I mean, I hear, I hear endlessly there's so-called bridge building, interfaith gatherings. And I'm astounded as to how Muslims will look you straight in the eye and tell you a lie. Maybe it's a, a lie of a half-truth. But on the other side of the equation, the clergy who are there, be they Jewish or Christian, they just smile and eat it all up. This is disastrous. So how is it getting approved? Approved? Dr. Bill? I mean, 
you have education boards that review curriculum before it's adopted by the school board. Yes, but they want to be tolerant in a multicultural society. And so therefore they don't want to upset a minority. And uh, even though there's 1.8 billion of them, Muslims are a protected minority. So therefore we do everything we can to keep them happy because we're tolerant. We will tolerate anything, Barry. Well, we may tolerate it right into our own destruction, Dr. Bill, and that's what scares the hell out of us. That's what's happening now. Thanks for joining us on American Truth Project. I want to thank our special guest today, Dr. Bill Warner. I urge all of you watching today to go to his website, Political Islam, and start ordering books. You've got your homework cut out for you. You need to know what he's talking about before it's too late. Remember, text from your cell phone the word TRUTH to 88202, 88202. You'll be signed up for our free text message service, so you'll get this and all our videos for free on your cell phone every day or whenever we release them, and we never charge for any of it. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Newsbaum.